to happen. Like I said, when we started mass literacy in Southeast Asia, nobody saw the potential. It's a bit like what happened during the colonial era when the British taught English and taught reading and writing. They did suspect that one day the people who they taught would read and write would turn out to be the first anti-colonialists, right? So there's always this mon monstrous potential in nation building. And what we're seeing now is this being amplified and, and multiplied because of the economic situation that we're facing uh, uh, worldwide. So I don't know what's going to happen, but what is clear, if you look at you know, the, the, the structures that we're dealing with, we have institutional structures, institutions that refuse to change. And then on the other hand, you have a younger generation demanding change. Now, do your physics. Yeah? And, and sooner or later, this will bring about some sort of transformation, either from top or from below. And I don't know how. I frankly don't know how it's going to pan out. But this will be the challenges that Malaysia will have to face. Because if Malaysia does not deal with this, growing generational gap. I'm not just talking about the polit politicians and political parties, but the political institutions, including even academic institutions. If we don't make way, for example, for younger academics, you know, then basically what's going to happen is you know, there will be this disconnect. And nations that suffer from this disconnect, well, basically there will be nations where the, the politics of the country does not reflect the realities on the ground. This might pan out in very different ways. When I look at, for example, other states that I research on, which, which are called, um, some people call dysfunctional states, when I look at you know, parts of southern Thailand, parts of southern Philippines, parts of Pakistan, what happens when there is this disconnect? When the state apparatus does not you know, cater to the growing demands of the public, then these demands will just be expressed in all sorts of different ways, either through subversive behavior, piracy, smuggling, all sorts of clandestine activities because basically you know these will have to find an outlet so successful nation building and successful governance is when states can anticipate these changes now at present professor ku doesn't seem all that uh, persuaded or impressed by the ability of, of 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 malaysia's political elite to anticipate these changes i'm i'm not all that impressed by any southeast asian country's ability to deal with these changes and note at what's happening in our region as a whole we see this in the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia. It's happening around the region as a well. whole. So this is where I think for the first time since the 50s, the nation state is in crisis. As an institution, it has to modernize, reform itself. It has to reinvent itself. But that's not being allowed to happen because there are entrenched political actors and agents who basically don't want to change. They don't want to change. They don't want to vacate their big houses. They don't want to vacate, you know, sell off their expensive cars. Now that, well, look at history and you see what happens to societies that don't go through this process. Change again is, is natural. One good thing we see about history is that, you know, what, what history teaches us is that change is normal. Change is normal. We all grow. We all grow like, you know, seeds turn to trees. We hope so. Otherwise, your seed will, will never fruit. Eh? We hope it grows. And nations have to grow. But I think there's been a a long tradition in, in, in Southeast Asia, like many parts of Asia, where governance is seen as something that can be controlled and predicted. Because politicians, technocrats, nation builders, state planners cannot imagine contingency and chance. Unfortunately, especially in new history writing, people like Simon Sharma now, you know, when they write histories, they take into account the fact that, you know, a lot of what passes as historical was actually accidental. You know, Malaysia could have gone so many different ways. Uh, and it can still go uh, in, in many different ways uh, as well. Um, there was a point raised about Sabah and Sarawak, and I, I, I agree with what uh, Prof. Uh, Ku pointed out. I also agree with this point about the word kerajaan, which I think we mistakenly use. In, in, in Bahasa Indonesia, for example, it's pemerintah for government. Yeah, government. The word for government is pemerintah. So when you say kerajaan in Indonesia, it means kingdom. There must be a sultan or a raja. Um, here we don't make that distinction uh, because to be literally correct, the only kerajaans in Malaysia, if you follow the term in its proper definition, would be the sultanates, the nine sultanates. The federal government is a pemerintah, not a kerajaan. But because they call themselves kerajaan, this might account for the sort of bowing culture that uh, you, you talked about earlier, uh, the sort of red carpet and bunga manga culture, which you know will, will change. You see, this this whole political culture that we are so used to now, the younger generation, like I said, are you know younger physically, 
but mentally, in a sense, more cynical because every generation inherits the cynicism of the, of the ones before. The younger generation now don't believe in slogans, uh, don't believe in empty promises. And the older generation is trying to, to adapt to this by adapting to technology because now there's a lot of talk about how to use Facebook to reach out to the young, you know, and again, all these like uh, old people, you know, now finally want to have a Facebook account and, you know, tweeting. I remember in a, in a neighboring country, I will not mention, um, some politicians, you know, wanting to win votes, uh, even open Twitter accounts. Uh, very clearly, you can see this guy's never used a Twitter account in his life, you know, so the first tweet he sends out to the whole country is testing. You know, uh, you know, and um, that what the younger generation of Malaysia is seeing now, I think, is this gap. He sees this gap. So I hope, I hope that as as Malaysia, uh, and I, here I'm being sectarian and biased. I, I'm thinking about my country. I hope that Malaysia, as it faces this, will still have you know, some historical resources left to remember that, you know, there was once a collective Malaysian project. And to go back to the point about race and religion then, you know, I mean, these are the things that are divisive. The point you make about religion, religion does not necessarily have to be a divisive factor, nor does race, you know, nor does race. Race does not have to be divisive. Religion does not have to be divisive. There are many societies I can also think of that are religiously plural. Why are they not fighting with each other? There are many countries that are uh, religiously homogenous and they're still killing each other. So, remember, religion and race as themselves, per se, are not necessarily divisive or inclusive. It's how they're deployed. I think the landscape of Malaysian politics is such that it favors precisely the deliberate deployment of ethnic, linguistic, cultural, or religious masks for the sake of political gains. And as long as that's going to be the landscape of our politics, then you know, you, you can talk about reform until the cows come home, and now these the cows are expensive, uh, you know, um, you can talk about cows, you know, about reform, but it still won't change anything, because there's always going to be these groups that will be playing with these markers. And Today we live in the age of democracy. Like I said, my, my attendant worry is this. I'm looking at democratization in Indonesia today. And Indonesia has changed a lot since 1998, yeah, a lot. The first few years, many of us were very optimistic. But honestly, in the last four years that I've been looking at Indonesia very closely, I really see the rise of some very nasty forms of hyper-nationalism, couched on you know, a vocabulary of ethnic and racial uh, exclusivism, but unfortunately articulated through a democratic process, through democratic parties. And um, I hope this will not be our fate. I hope that, you know, we, Malaysians will be able to understand that democracy, you know, one man, one vote, one woman, one vote, does not simply mean that, you know, any thug, any gangster can create a political party, create an NGO, and go out and use the tools of democracy to undermine itself. You know, because democracy must evolve a means of self-defense. It is a system that is easily hijacked if left to the wrong people. People can nowadays even you know extreme right-wing NGOs call themselves NGOs. You know, <laughs> you know charities even. You know, you have charity organizations that preach some really nasty sectarian divisive language. I hope that we as a nation, especially the younger generation of Malaysians, will understand and be able to appreciate the distinction between these two, you know, between inclusive, genuinely inclusive Malaysian-minded groups and, you know, these dangerous exclusive groups that, that use the language, even sometimes the language of rights and community rights, to actually further what I think are actually very dangerous uh, and, and in the long run divisive uh, 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 sorts of politics. Um, Prof, I don't know whether you want to address it, but the first question about the first Malaysian party I thought was interesting. Um, about Parti Negara, I believe you mentioned. Yeah. Although I think the, the party you're actually referring to is the Independence for Malaysia pa Malaya Party, which was uh, the, the inclusive party. Yeah, that one was caught in a 